Our guest today is Mo Esani. Mo is a native of Iran who found his way to the University of Michigan, multiple degrees, and a lifelong career in engineering. As a University of Arizona professor emeritus, he now devotes his working hours to creating structural solutions for municipalities across the country and more recently to solving major ecological damage caused by global warming. Mo, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Feel Like You Belong. Oh, thank you, and nice to be with you. And just for uh, full disclosure, we should also let our viewers know that you and I were actually physically in the same room together uh, two weeks ago, but unfortunately the airline gods did not smile upon your connections and you missed our, our broadcast time. So we're doing this remotely, but uh, I can assure our viewers that you are uh, an absolutely lovely person in, in person. So anyway, thanks for, for doing this via Skype. Oh, my pleasure. So uh, talk a little bit about this. You uh, were, uh, grew up in Iran. What made you decide to come to the University of Michigan? Well, I, uh, as you said, I grew up in Iran. And I uh, was there until I finished high school in 1972. I had a couple of cousins who at the time were uh, in the middle of their engineering studies at the University of Michigan. And so uh, as is customary, usually when you ask your cousins to help you get a uh, application or I-20 to get you over to here. They uh, found me a school near uh, Ann Arbor, and so I moved here to be with them and starting my uh, my own education in uh, January of 1973. You started taking uh, English as a second language classes before because they have a certain English proficiency to, to get up and running, and, and that's a longer story than we have time for. But but basically, you did your your undergraduate and your graduate work uh, in Ann Arbor. Yes, I guess uh, you know. So I did my bachelor's, master's, and PhD all at the University of Michigan. I was there from uh, 1973 to um, August or July of 1982, and then at that time I moved to uh, Tucson at, to at the University of Arizona. Sure. And before I, I eventually want to talk about your teaching and and your your engineering work, but you were telling me a story if, if people who understand world history were following the dates that you just gave us, you know, there was a time, 1979-1980, when all of a sudden uh, U.S. and Iranian relations took a, a deep turn to the south. Yes, yes. And, and, and in that time, you were actually decided to travel back. You were maybe between degrees or you wanted to go back home for a while. No, I was between degrees. I was actually in the middle of my PhD program, and I found out that my father had a uh, heart attack, and uh, so I wanted to make sure that I would, you know, I wasn't sure how much, you know, what shape he was in. So I wanted to go visit him, and I talked at the time, asked my professor to uh, what I thought would be a three-week trip, and he said, "Sure, you know, since you're not taking any classes and just doing research, it's fine. Go and come back." So I left. I think it was just like uh, around the, the end of March of uh, 1980 and uh, went to Iran hoping to, you know, just visit and come back for three weeks. And within a week of my arrival in Iran, if some of your re uh, viewers may recall that that was, you know, the, unfortunately in the midst of the hostage crisis. Right. And uh, so uh, President Carter canceled all Iranian visas. And I was uh, stranded outside the U.S. for almost uh, four and a half months until I finally made it back in August of uh, that year. So a lot of bureaucracy, uh, some connections with uh, happy, happy connections with some people back in Ann Arbor to get you a visa to, to come back to the United uh, States. Uh, you know, absolutely. I, I think this is really, you know, the, the, the folks in uh, Michigan were so... Uh, generous and kind and you know i'll never really forget the help that they provided um, i know there were several people who were in my position and they were uh, they never could make it back to the u.s but we had a lady um, whose name should be really mentioned and i'm so grateful to her uh, charlene schmalt i know she's retired i stayed in touch with her and i know she retired a few years ago but she used to work at the international center at the university of michigan and uh, i had not met her before i had started my trip but uh, during the, you know, that crisis and trying to get help from uh, University of Michigan, I 
she helped me a lot. And finally, uh, through the office of Senator Carl Levin, they uh, managed to get a visa for me. And uh, so I'm, I'm very grateful to, to all of those people who helped uh, me come back. So you, you came back, finished your PhD in, in civil engineering, and then got yeah. a job right away at the University of Arizona in, in their yes, yes, engineering that's it. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And I uh, pretty much, uh, so I, you know, I tell people my life story is pretty easy. I went to one university and I had one faculty job at one University of Arizona pretty much all my career. Now, while you were, while you were doing your teaching, you actually started a small company. Uh, that's true. It was kind of a byproduct of our research. You know, uh, back in uh, in the, the late eighties, uh, with a colleague, we started this new field of using uh, uh, composite materials like carbon uh, fabric, uh, and and to strengthen the infrastructure using these materials. Uh, prior to that. Uh, these materials were primarily being used for the military application, and so they were really expensive and beyond the reach of typical construction uh, projects. But, but they were then, being uh, used in military applications because they were strong and super light, as I recall. Exactly, and and very durable, you know. So, uh, but that uh, then about the same time in the late eighties, uh, if. Your review, you know, viewers recall it was the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Berlin Wall. So all of a sudden, the need for uh, the use of these materials in military was uh, drastically reduced. And so there was a glut of these materials in the market and the cost went down. And then it made sense to start using them in civil applications. So we found some really unique uses for these that, you know, taking a deteriorated beam or column of a bridge or building uh, and by putting these materials, applying it to them almost like a wallpaper, uh, we could make them significantly stronger than new. And it's, it's, it's hard to actually conceive because when we think of a massive structure like, you know, uh, uh, bridges and, and columns holding up massive, you know, uh, infrastructure, you know, to wrap it with this material, which looks, you know, fairly thin, but, you know, when it hardens, it becomes so incredibly strong and rigid. It, it, it the simplicity of the, the elegant simplicity of that blew me away when you were telling me about that. Uh, th that's true. And it's really, you know, in, in, uh, maybe some of the elegance of it uh, is in its simplicity that when you explain it to people, you know, people usually get it. So these materials, when even though they are very flexible when we apply them, but uh, within a few hours or a day when they harden, they become three times uh, stronger than steel. And uh, the other property that they have is that they will never corrode. So that's one of the main uh, problems with our current state of infrastructure is the corrosion of reinforcing material. And these material, you know, these carbon uh, products, uh, they basically uh, last forever virtually. So I, I failed to mention the name of your company is called Quake Wrap. Yes. And, and, and so that, that was really because our initial application was, uh, you know, this was um, in the late, uh, you know, 1989 and 1994, there were a couple of major earthquakes in California. In Southern California. And, yeah. Yes. And then a lot of these uh, bridge columns were failing. So uh, one of the first uses of our system was to wrap a column of a bridge, for example, with this material and make it earthquake proof. And so we gave the company the name of uh, Quake Wrap. So we would wrap a structure and make it earthquake proof. Yeah. Fantastic. So now at what point did you decide that, hey, I'm going to do this full time and stop teaching? Well, you know, I started the company in 1994, which was you know right after the Northridge earthquake. And then for uh, for about um, the, the, the next uh, 10, 15 years, I kind of had the company and uh, was still a faculty member. So uh, it was more like a hobby and occasionally we would do some projects. Uh, but then finally, in uh, around eight years ago, I really decided that, that this was my true passion. And I, you know, I, <laughs> you only live once. You better, uh, it's you know, as, as you know, it's uh, for so for so many of uh, people who are in the academic field. You know, their uh, ultimate goal is to get become a full professor and tenured, and then you have a lifetime of guaranteed paycheck. You don't want to give that up. But 
I decided that you know this was really something that I was my passion and I wanted to pursue it. So in spite of my lack of training in business, I I took the dive and I said, let's see what what this world has to offer. You didn't have the MBA, but you plowed yeah. forward with your technical skills and and made it into a business. So this has taken you quite a few places around the world. <laughs> Yes, we have really grown significantly now. Um, our, in my company, I have about 65 or so employees. We have an office in Australia, opening another office in Chile, and, and we have uh, uh, used our products uh, globally in Japan, Nigeria, you know, different places. Uh, I uh, jokingly say that I'm the only one I know who has actually take money from Nigerians. <laughs> <laughs> Structure, so. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. So I want to switch topics a little bit because I, I'm totally impressed with what your company does and, and the solutions it brings, uh, engineering solutions to uh, places across the world. But recently you discovered something else that your technology can be used for, and that's uh, saving the coral reefs. Can you talk about that? Yes, so as a result of the work that we were doing in the company, we developed a, a special type of pipe that we have been using to um, repair uh, existing pipes with it primarily. And what is unique about the construction of this pipe is that unlike other pipes that have a solid wall and they become pretty heavy, uh, in this pipe we use a um, Sanovich construction technology where the core wall of the pipe is a light honeycomb material and then this gets covered on the skin with some carbon fiber and, and so so we end up with a lightweight pipe and very economical this pipe uh, in fact uh, last year the american society of civil engineers awarded me the, the 2016 innovation award for the world's first green and sustainable pipe for this product so um, then, you know, in this process, we realized that we could actually make this pipe continuously on site. So we are developing an equipment now that we could send the equipment to the field. And unlike conventional pipes, which are made in, you know, 10, 20 foot long pieces and are shipped from the factory to the job site and connected on site, this pipe is made on site. So if some municipality or water district needs uh, 20 miles of a, say, 24-inch pipe, we could send this equipment to the field and make them one stick of pipe 20 miles long with no joints that would leak and, and all of that. So uh, uh, then uh, when I was faced with this problem of the coral reefs, you know, I thought that this uh, infinite pipe solution can really be very effectively used in uh, addressing this problem. As... Um, as, as you may know, the, the, you know, the problem with these coral reefs is, is that global warming has uh, re, uh, caused a rise in the temperature of the water, especially in these shallow portions of the oceans yeah, where exactly. these corals uh, exist. And uh, you have a few miles away, typically in most places where the ocean is deeper, you have an abundance of supply of colder water. But uh, it is a matter of, you know, getting that cold water to this, uh, replace the warm water with the cold water. So conventional pipes, for example, would, uh, if they were going to be used for this application, it would be extremely expensive. And they're probably uh, too heavy as well, correct? Too heavy, exactly. And, you know, it would be just really not, that would not be uh, a, a good solution and at you all. Have to, you would have to assemble them and just so logistically so many, yes, exactly. so many problems. So I know that you brought the piping solution. Um, whose idea was it to generate sort of perpetual motion energy to to have this project work? Yeah, this was, again, you know, an idea that uh, we have come up with that, you know, the, the, there are, uh, I was actually looking at uh, the, the U.S. government had recently, there was a, a, an announcement from the Department of Energy that they had funded several companies that have developed, uh, are looking at various uh, wave uh, energy technologies to generate electricity from the wave. And as, as I was reading through those, I realized that in this case, really, we don't even need to, uh, I mean, the one way would be to generate electricity from the wave and run the pump uh, with that electricity. But then I realized that we actually don't even need uh, to generate electricity. We could just mechanically use the motion of the wave to convert it into an arm that moves and pumps water. So it becomes a 
almost like a perpetual <laughs> motion. Uh, and what, so once you have this setup, uh, the, the pipe is made that you in, uh, make the pipe on a boat or ship. And as it is made, you just drape it on the bottom of the ocean. One end of the pipe would be in the shallow, warm portion of the near the corals. And the other end would be at the deep section of the ocean. And then this pump would constantly circulate water, uh, cold water to that warmer region and uh, hopefully solve that problem. What it really struck me is that you don't have a degree in, in marine uh, biology or, you know, this is not your field, but there is a very simple, elegant, practical solution to, <laughs> to solve by, by engineers. And so yeah. um, I, I, love, I love this. We have to wrap up in just a moment. But the theme of our show is belonging. So as mm -hmm. someone who came here from another place, had to learn the language, had to learn the culture, had to establish a new normal. What does belonging mean to you? Uh, to me, really, you know, uh, belonging means uh, the welcoming reception that I have personally received. I've never felt uh, as a foreigner in this country, you know, from, from my student days, you know, till now that I have, you know, for the last 35 or so years been a U.S. citizen. But I really felt always welcome. And the fact that, you know, it is really this, uh, you know, United States is so unique in providing opportunities for people from all backgrounds to pursue their dreams. And I know that a lot of these achievements that I have, what little achievement I have made in my life, it wouldn't have been possible in really in, in almost uh, no other country that I could think of, including my homeland of Iran, because... Um, it, it, it is really this um, the whole environment in U.S. and the government support and the various grant opportunities that uh, makes this possible for people to grow and you know contribute to the society. Fantastic. We're going to have to leave it there, but I want to thank you so much for joining us and, and sharing your your insights and your life story with our viewers. Uh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed the interview. Thank you for joining us. If you're watching on TV. Stay with us for some tips on American English, culture, and humor. For our friends on the internet, we hope you'll join our ongoing conversation with the impressive immigrants who contribute their vast skills to making the United States a better place.